So when you're ready, we can begin. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> time. Okay. okay, so uh, welcome back again. And we're going to continue this, uh, what I would consider a marvelous sutta about how to overcome ill will and resentment and anger and all such emotions. And uh, the, we saw in the previous one, we are looking at five different kinds of people. And the first kind of person, the uh, method being used is to shift your attention from the bad qualities to the good ones, to remind yourself of the good qualities in the person. So very often it's just a matter of building up that side of things and to remember that, to make it into something important and significant. Uh, and uh, often what you will find is that there are certain persons in your life that you find difficult. Uh, yeah, I think this is very, a very common experience. Uh, and uh, that is often where we need to focus, especially if they are important people in our lives, uh, people that we, you know, you have to meet quite regularly or whatever, for whatever reason. Uh, then that is where we often need to focus to overcome the problem. We need to, it's important to, you know, on the spiritual path, to look at the obstacles that we have, the main problems that are coming in our way and focus on those big obstacles uh, because that is where we will be able to make a dent in this defilement and be able to uh, move forward more quickly as a consequence. Uh, so you have to be realistic about such things. Uh. So uh, that is the first one. Huh? And uh, so we move on to the second one, which is very similar. The, the only difference really is the simile that is used to explain the, uh, the, the method. Uh, and apart from that, it is, I would reckon it's, I reckon it's largely the same. I would be interested to hear anyone who has a different opinion, but uh, that's how it looks to me. So uh, this is what Venerable Sariputta says. Uh, how should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by speech is impure, but whose behavior by body is pure. Suppose there was a lotus pond covered with moss and algae. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They will plunge into the lotus pond and sweep away the moss and algae, and drink from the cupped hands, and be on their way. In the same way, at, the at that time, you should ignore the person's impure behavior by speech and focus on their pure behavior by body. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person. So here we just find someone with a different set of bad qualities, different set of good qualities. And yeah, now they have re reversed the speech and the body. And I take that just to be a you know, it, it's just an alternative approach. It, it, it doesn't really make much difference. But I think one of the things that may be read into that is that what we consider the good and bad qualities in, the, in even the same individual may actually change over time. Yes, sometimes we may have to change our strategy for a particular person. It may actually change. Maybe that is part of it. Yeah. This, understanding that uh, people always changing and uh, over time they may increase in their wholesome qualities and they may <coughs> decline in the bad qualities. Uh, um, further down we come to the person who is uh, has only bad qualities and now we're looking at someone who has a bit of both and we come down to the person who has only bad qualities and and that is where our strategy will have to change a little bit because you cannot see anything good in that person. And, and one of the things to remember with all of these different kinds of people is not to judge people too strongly. And it's very easy to think that we have understood someone and we judge them to have certain bad qualities or we judge them to be completely evil, maybe a really bad person. And, and when, when we do that, when we judge someone too much, it is very easy to kind of pigeonhole them in such a way that they feel they can't really escape from our judgment. Yeah, they feel they feel pigeonholed by us. And very often we will feel that with people around us when they judge us harshly and they kind of keep that judgment. And it's a very unpleasant situation to be in because you feel like you cannot really escape, yeah, regardless of what you do or regardless of how kind you are, whatever. It's like you are trapped in that uh, 
um, in, in that judgment. Uh, and, uh, and this is so out of kindness for the people around us. We should never judge people, in my opinion, too harshly. Uh, we should always be open to the person being able to change. We should all, always be open to seeing new realities of that person, different angles, different perspectives of that person. Uh, and when we do that, we act, it's actually an act of kindness because it allows the person to change. Uh, and it allows them to feel that they're not being judged. And that makes them more courageous in trying to change. It makes them more willing to show the good side. But if they feel judged already, there's not much point in even trying to be good. It's almost like you condemn that person to be a bad person by judging them too harshly. So I think a lack of judgment is actually an act of, it's an important act of kindness. And we're giving people the opportunity to show other sides of themselves and to change and to be a different person. Always looking at the positive. It's one of the things I have learned from Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm is this master of always seeing the positive in people. Yeah, and it's it's wonderful to be around someone like that, uh, because uh, you, um, you you never really feel judged. Yeah, and you know that even if you do something stupid, it's going to forgive you in you know straight away. Yeah? He no, never carries any resentment. I, I never met any person who who carries so absolutely zero resentment as Ajahn Brahm. It doesn't matter what people do. If, you, if they kick you out of their monasteries and they do whatever, he, he lets go straight away. He doesn't carry these things with him. And that's such a powerful example, one of the great examples in my life of learning how to let go of uh, uh, other people, always seeing the positive side. Uh, and he has this uh, uh, marvelous ability. Uh, sometimes it can be a bit infuri <laughs> infuriating. It's strange because sometimes it's like you want to see the Kind of the negative side, yeah? but he refuses to see it. He, oh, he always has a good reason why not. Uh, and I think that's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful example. And we should really strive to do the same. Uh, give people the freedom, give people the gift of our non judgment, uh, because it actually is uh, an act of kindness towards others. Uh. Anyway, it, it's kind of part and parcel of the same uh, idea. So I, I just wanted to bring that in there because there isn't that much to say about the person we're talking about now. Um, but uh, so here we have the person who is, uh, you will notice, uh, there is a lotus pond covered with moss and uh, aquatic plants, plants, yeah, or, or algae, if you like. Yeah. And um, the um, idea here, of course, is that the pond here is the person, yeah, and the uh, moss and the algae, this is the kind of the bad qualities in that person. Yeah, it makes the pond kind of a bit ugly and a bit murky if there's all these kind of plants growing on the surface, except maybe if there are lotuses or some beautiful water lilies, but this is like murky kind of plants, moss and algae. And uh, so that's the bad qualities, yeah? And then you have this uh, person coming along and all of these things are really and metaphors for anger, yeah, oppressed by the heat. Yeah, and this is really kind of the inner heat is obviously what is referred to here, yeah, the angry person. And you are weary if you stay angry for a long time. After a while, you get really tired. Anger tires you out. And when you start to cool down after being really angry for a while, all you want to do is kind of lie down and, and have a snooze or something because it kind of is so exhausting to be angry over a long period of time. Right? And uh, you are thirsty and parched. Yeah? And again, the idea here is that hopefully, if you are the right kind of person, you're looking for a solution. Anger cries out for a solution. You want to resolve this in the right way. Yeah? And the solution that we often look for when we're angry with somebody is the solution of changing that person. That's what anger often wants to do. Right? Yeah? Anger is there precisely because we think that by getting angry, getting the energy of anger, and then using that to tell the person the right thing, the, the, the thing will be solved. But uh, that's not usually how things get resolved. Uh, yeah? Very often that backfires. Uh, maybe it works occasionally, but usually it doesn't really work. And so the solution, rather, is very different. The solution lies in our own psyche, how we deal with the situation. And then once we have cooled down, once we are okay, then we might be able to bring the issue up with the person, and then we might be able to get somewhere because we are cool. And when we are cool, much more likely the other person will listen to what we have to say here. So these are all kind of these, uh, I take this to be metaphors for anger. And so what you do then, uh, yeah, instead of uh, uh, telling the person off, what you do is you plunge into the pond, you sweep away all the negative qualities. Yeah, Again, that's all the rubbish of the world. Uh, and then you 
uh, drink from your cupped hands, you imbibe, you take in those good qualities. Uh, and once you take them in, of course, you carry them with you wherever you go afterwards. Uh, so again, this idea of the sweeping away the bad things uh, and taking on board the good stuff and bringing that with you, uh, that, that is what you bring with you into the future and you can kind of bring it out in your mind uh, whenever it is required, the same uh, rough idea that is being used there. So uh, anyway, uh, that is the, uh, I, again, the idea of shifting your focus uh, from the bad to the good, yeah? And what is interesting here, of course, is you're focusing on the same person. It's one of those questions that often come up when we do, when we deal with the, these bad qualities that often talks about, you know, changing the object or whatever. What exactly does that mean? And changing the object could mean looking at someone else. Yeah, you're looking at one person. Oh no, I get upset. So you look in a different direction. That's like changing the object. but. That is not the ideal way of doing it. Sometimes that might be okay, but really what we should be doing is to see that particular object in a new way. And that is what we're seeing here, rather than just kind of looking away. That's just like a band-aid. Yeah? As soon as we look back again, we have the same problem. The idea is really to change our attitude to the object we have right in front of us. So that is the most powerful way, because then we are really developing our mind in an entirely, in a different direction. We're turning around that super tank, which has this massive momentum, gradually moving it around, turning it eventually, hopefully, 180 degrees in a different direction uh, from before. Uh, so let's come to the third person here. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior, my body and speech, are impure, but who's, who gets an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time? Suppose there was a little water in a cow's hoof print. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty and parched. They might think this little bit of water is in a cow's hoof print. If I drink it with my cupped hands or a bowl, I'll stir it and disturb it, making it undrinkable. Why don't I get down on all fours and drink it up like a cow, then be on my way? So that's what they do. In the same way, at the time when you, at that time, you should ignore that person's impure bodily behavior and speech behavior and focus on the fact that they get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. So here we have someone with many bad qualities, yeah, but they have one good quality, the openness and clarity of the heart. And what these words are in Pali, the openness is a vibhara, and vibhara is the opposite of the nivarana. Yeah, vibhara and nivarana. So it's the opposite of nivarana. So in other words, it means a mind that is pure. Yeah, a mind that is clear. A mind that uh, is ready for samadhi even. Yeah, this might be a person who can attain samadhi even because of that. Uh, clarity of the heart. This is pasada. This is like the uh, an inspired and clear heart. Uh, kind of, uh, uh, yeah. You know, it's similar to the idea of having no defilements when you have clarity of the mind, yeah, these things. So it is interesting, yeah, and this says something about the complexity of the world that we live in. That uh, sometimes people who may look bad and dodgy on the outside, yeah, they may actually have some very beautiful qualities within. Or you can find the opposite, people who look, may look, look the part on the outside, and yeah, they look really really nice or whatever, but still they may actually have a lot of defilements in the mind. Or sometimes you may meet a monk who looks the part or a nun who looks the part on the outside, the robe is just right, they walk in the right way, they just look straight ahead, they don't look to the left or the right, they really look like a super duper monk. It turns out that actually they quite not really haven't got the act together at all. They're just kind of using kind of willpower, the externals are what matter. Then you have the monk whose robe is always falling off and dragging behind them like a bridal train. Have you seen those monks whose robes drag behind like a bridal train? I think you know, 
might know who I'm talking about. And uh, then they kind of, you know, are really messy in so many different ways. But it turns out that the mind is kind of really, really solid. Yeah? And it's interesting, you find this in the suttas. Yeah, the suttas have precisely this. Yeah? It's like in their good reforms, you have the idea of the monk who really looks the part and who is the part, that's kind of the arahant. Then you have the look, one who looks the part but doesn't really have it within. And then you have the one who doesn't look the part but actually has it. And then the one who doesn't look the part and hasn't got it. Yeah. So these are actually specifically mentioned in the suttas. And when I look around the world, that is exactly what I see. Yeah. You actually do find precisely this. So we have to be very careful again with judgment. We always have to be as open minded as we can. And here, what the Venerable Sariputta is saying is that we should really try very hard to look for those uh, good qualities, yeah, the, the beautiful mental states that are there, because they are worthy of an enormous amount of respect. This is a person who has some very beautiful things going on in their life. So the fact that they are, have bad body, bodily and verbal conduct, of course, that is, that, that is negative, but there's also something beautiful to be celebrated about this person there. Uh, so we should, again, be very careful with our judgment. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, then you have this beautiful simile again that uh, you come along oppressed by the heat and yeah, you are angry, you are tired, you're weary because of that. Uh, and you are uh, thirsty in part, trying to find a solution uh, to this problem. Uh, and then you see a little bit of water, yeah, tiny bit of, <laughs> of good qualities right there. Uh, and of course, you have to be very careful when there's only a small amount of good qualities. Uh, you have to focus down very narrowly, not to kind of look too far to the right or too far to the left, because then you see the not the bad stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, the anger comes back again. You have to learn to focus very narrowly on those good qualities and rejoice in those good qualities uh, and feel really happy about that. Uh, yeah. So, and the, the kind of memorable simile here should be like the cow who gets down on all four and then drink up that water, yeah, because you cannot use a, a vessel or anything like that because you will disturb it up. And what is interesting about this is the simple fact that, that you, you should go to quite a large extent to see the good qualities in somebody. Yeah, you should really try this really hard. Why is that? Well. Uh, what it means, seeing the good qualities in someone, really means developing metta for that person. Yeah, you have metta for somebody when you see the good qualities. Uh, just like you have anger if you just focus on the negative things. Uh, so what it really means that uh, we should go to quite, uh, uh, to quite, quite far to be able to uh, to try to have metta for the people around us. Uh, this is really what this is about. Yeah. And this is a very interesting point. Why is it that we should go so far with the idea of metta? Why can't we go on with the next method here, which is the idea of compassion? And um, I think the answer to that, maybe, it is just my, my, my guess really, is that metta is a quality that never really goes wrong. Yeah? When you see the good in the people around you, when you focus on the good qualities, and there are lots of good qualities in the world. Sometimes we just need to look in the right place, and then we see people with marvelous qualities around us, and I'm sure you know what I mean. And sometimes just the people who are very quiet people, not the kind of the you know, the big, the, 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 the large, big mouths in the world, but people who just quiet, live ordinary lives, and they go about their business, but do so in a good-hearted way. There's lots and lots of people like that in the world. Yeah, so we need to uh, look very carefully, and when we focus on that metta, when we see the good qualities in the world around us, it is always has a positive effect on our mind. Why? Because it purifies us. It is always has a purifying effect. It always lifts your spirits. It always makes you feel good. And yeah, there is, there is no downside to metta. But once you go to karuna, the compassion, uh, if you do it right, it doesn't have a downside. But if you get it slightly wrong, yeah, it is not. Uh, karuna is the idea of wanting to alle alleviate suffering for people. Uh, compassion, in other words. Uh, but uh, if you focus on that, it is also easy to see the suffering in the world. And sometimes if you focus too much on the suffering, or you focus on the suffering in slightly the wrong way, yeah, a way where you feel a bit of despair or whatever about this, uh, then it can lead to sadness. Yeah, it can lead to a loss of energy. Yeah? 
And you hear about this. I've heard about this in the Buddhist world many times. If you focus too much on compassion and suffering in the world, it leaves you completely depleted, utterly incapable of doing anything whatsoever. And then you have taken it too far. You become, you know, you become like a, you, you know, you, there's nothing you can do anymore. You become like a lame duck in the Buddhist world. You just have to sort of, uh, you know, hang out there and wait for your energies to re-arise. Uh. So this is where I, I think compassion goes wrong. Uh. And there are practices being done in the Buddhist world, and you hear about them sometimes, uh, where precisely, in my opinion, that mistake is being made. Uh, and it doesn't lead to the energy that is required on the Buddhist path. Uh. So, uh, uh, this is why I think when Bosariputta here emphasizes the, the idea of metta so much uh, to enable us to kind of gain that those qualities of mind that are inspiring energy field uh, you know, actually have a positive effect on the path. Uh. But, and this is the problem which comes next, is that sometimes there are, are people who we cannot see any good qualities in them. Yeah, all we see is bad stuff, and uh, so or maybe a little bit of good quality, but it's so small we can't really not really able to make anything out of it. Yeah, and then of course, if that is the case, then we have to do something else. We have to have a different strategy. Meta looking for the good qualities is not going to work anymore, yeah? and that is when we have to do the compassion practice. Now, before I. Uh, read this out. Uh, one of the important points to remember here is that if you do meet someone and you cannot really see any good qualities in this person, yeah, or you can see only a tiny bit of good qualities, uh, it is uh, important to remember that that is just your perception of the person. Uh, you don't know who the person is. You don't know the qualities really. It is your perception. And that is already an act of humility on our part to recognize our, the limits of our own knowledge of other people. And what that does to us when you think like that is that you allow the perception to change again. You don't get stuck in that perception. Yeah? You allow that you know, down the track the person might uh, seem different to you. They may even change, but certainly they may seem different to you. To you. There may be things there which you haven't seen before. Yeah? So always remember that our perceptions are precisely that. They are our perceptions and they are subject to our biases and our uncertainties. They are subject to impermanence like everything else. They are subject to our limited knowledge of the world and all of these kinds of things. And when we remember that, we become much more able to go with the flow and allow alternatives, alternative ways of looking at the world arise down the track. It's a little bit similar to what I was talking about before, about not judging people too harshly. This is along something similar, along the similar kind of lines, yeah? Remembering our own um, limitations. So, uh, but still, yeah, when we have, when we, our perception is very negative of a person, compassion is the right way. And this is how Venerable Sariputta explains this. Uh, how should you get rid of resentment for a person whose bodily behavior and verbal behavior is impure and who does not get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time? Suppose a person was traveling along a road and they were sick, suffering and gravely ill. And it was a long way to a village, whether ahead or behind it and they didn't have any suitable food or medicine or a competent carer and someone or someone to bring them to the neighborhood of a village. Then another person traveling along the road sees them and thinks of them with nothing but compassion, kindness and sympathy. Oh, may this person get suitable food or medicine or a competent carer or someone to bring them to the neighborhood of a village. Why? So that they don't come to ruin right here. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore that person's impure behavior by body and speech, and the fact that they don't get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, and think of them with nothing but compassion, kindness, and sympathy. Oh, may this person give up bad conduct by body, speech, and mind, and develop good conduct by body, speech, and mind. Why? 
So when the body breaks up after death, they are not reborn in a bad destination, a bad place, the underworld or hell. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person. So uh, this is really quite powerful stuff, the idea that if someone has all bad qualities, you should think of them as a sick person, a gravely ill. Yeah, it, it is it's marvelous. It's such a different way of thinking about people than we normally do. Yeah, you meet someone who is really nasty and they may be nasty to you. And it is so easy to get upset when someone treats us in a way which seems to be bad. Yeah, very easy to get upset. Why? Because it feels so personal. It's like them against me. And when someone does something bad against me, 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 me. <laughs> This is how we think, and it's natural that we think in this way, because we are the center of our own universe, each one of us, so it's completely natural. But uh, it is that personal aspect of it that makes us upset. Yeah? To take away that personal aspect, think about this in a slightly different way, and suddenly it opens up an entire possibility of an entirely different reaction. So when you remember that this person is sick, yeah, then, of course, it, you think about them in a, in a completely different way, yeah, because uh, suddenly you can't excuse them. If someone is mentally ill or sick in some other way, you don't take what they say very seriously. If a mentally ill person starts to abuse you, you kind of shrug your shoulders, yeah, you think, oh, yeah, whatever, they just don't know what they're doing here. And the point is that we are all a little bit mentally ill, yeah, we're all deluded to some extent, we all get angry sometimes. Uh, and uh, for this reason, when someone treats you unreasonably, uh, you should think of them in that way, even as if they are mentally ill, they are deluded, they don't know what they're doing, they're crazy for that time uh, uh, when they do something bad against someone else. And uh, so this is uh, the right way of thinking about someone, you know, the Buddha has this beautiful saying, I, I can't remember whether I mentioned this at the beginning of this retreat, uh, this beautiful saying in the, this is found in the Kosala Sangyuta, the third uh, collect, chapter on connected discourses, uh, where the Buddha is talking to King Pasenadi of Kosala, this one of the most famous kings at the time of the Buddha, ruling over what may have been the largest country in north of India at that time, a very large piece of land. And he goes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha that uh, those people who treat other people bad, they act as if they are their own enemy. And those people who treat other people well, they act as if they are their own friend. Yeah, obviously, because if you treat other people bad, if you're making bad karma for yourself, you feel bad about yourself. And because of that, it's like you're your own enemy because you're creating long-term suffering for yourself. Creating suffering is something we do for our enemies, yeah, ideally, not to ourselves. So you're treating yourself bad by treating other people bad. And in the same way, by the same token, if you are friendly towards others, then you are treating yourself as your own friend because we want to, uh, you know, we're creating happiness for our long term future. So we are friend being friendly against ourselves. So anyone who does something bad, yeah, who treats themselves as an enemy, they don't know what they're doing. They're out of their mind. They're, they are deluded. They want happiness in the world, just like everyone else, but actually they are creating suffering for themselves. And if someone who wants happiness is creating suffering for themselves, they don't know what they're doing. They are blind. They are, you know, they're, they are kind of walking around in the darkness. There's no light to see what they're doing. You know, stumping their toes in the little stones, and they're hitting their head in the rafters of the ceiling because they have no idea what's going on. And they go, "Ouch!" And they're just you know, everything is just blind darkness for people like that. And when you remember that that this person is deluded, and you understand that it's not about you, it's about them. They are the one who have the problem. And you turn things around, and instead of being self-centered about things, uh, you become compassionate instead. Uh, you start to understand what is really going on, uh, and then uh, the whole everything turns around. Instead of thinking about me, the small world of me, the world which is kind of tiny, when you, with kind of the boundaries are very close to you, and you feel anyone who kind of comes within those boundaries, and they get scary, and you they are your enemy because they have a 
entered your territory in a bad way. You have my little world. It's so painful to be in such a little world. It is so scary because everyone else seems like a threat and a danger to you. But the moment you step out of that world, you know it has got nothing to do with you. It has to do with the other person. They are deluded. Sometimes we are deluded too, of course, but in that right now, they are deluded. You turn things around from your small little world of me to the large world of compassion, where you embrace the whole world, including yourself, because you understand we are all in this uh, this, this dilemma, this problem together. We are all here and we're all suffering from exactly the same problems. And then you have compassion for the person and you think, oh, may this person find a way out of his anger, out of the bad conduct, so they don't end up in a terrible place in the future. What a beautiful way that is to look at things. What a marvelous way that it emerges from the whole Buddhist idea of non-self. Yeah, the idea that we are conditioned as human beings. That very often we have no choice. We are trapped in our personality. We want to be kind because I think almost everyone knows somewhere deep down that kindness is equivalent to happiness. We feel good, the other person feels good, the whole world is lifted up, the whole world is supported by morality and kindness, and it is dragged down by immorality and darkness. Yeah, we know that that is true, and yet somehow we cannot help it but do bad things. Why? Well, simply because we are conditioned. Our personality has been formed in this way. We are trapped in these terrible negative habits. Yeah? And we just can't escape them. And we're all subject to that to some extent, except maybe the arahant or someone who's all, almost at the end of the path. So have compassion. You know, when someone does something terrible, they don't know what they're doing. They can't help themselves. They're trapped in that habit or whatever it is. Have compassion for them. And sometimes all you can do is have compassion from afar. You can't even do anything. You can't actually have an active kind of compassion because the character is such it doesn't allow you to be actively compassionate. But you can always have inward compassion inside of yourself. And then you may have to, uh, uh, to uh, protect yourself a little bit if it is a person of bad character by not doing anything outwardly. So these are really powerful teachings. Yeah, you can start to see now how it is possible not to be angry or have ill will with anyone in the entire world. Yeah, if you practice in this way, you can embrace everybody, even the most vile kind of person. Yeah, I'm not sure if the word vile is really a good one because that is almost like a judgment already. But if we don't see it as a judgment, but more as just a matter of conduct, yeah, then even those people, we can have a sense of compassion towards them. So that's what the Buddha says here. He says that this person is sick, suffering, gravely ill. They are deluded. They don't know what they're doing. They're mentally confused. They're walking in darkness. And there's a long way to the nearest village. Yeah? The nearest village might be a place with maybe like a monastery yeah, where they can go and hear some Dhamma or maybe some other place where there is some wisdom to kind of sort you out and make you look right, a good teacher or whatever. There's a long way to the nearest village. Yeah. Far, hard to find, and they don't have suitable food or medicine. They don't have any dhamma, any teaching that they can read or listen to, to guide them in the right way, such as the teaching you're listening to right now. They don't have that. So they are lost in a sense. They don't have nothing to guide them. This, again, this, this is about the idea, the importance of the Kalyana Mitta, the Buddha to support you, to point you in the right direction. Without that, they were basically lost. No food, no medicine, no competent care, no Buddha to be, to be around you, no kalyanamittas to sort you out and to help you, or anyone to bring them into the neighborhood of that village, no kalyanamitta who can bring you to someone wiser. And then someone else comes along, you see them, yeah, and when you see the person in that situation, you see them from afar, yeah, you have a kind of the bird's eye perspective, and often that is easier. If you see someone behaving badly from afar, it's easier to have this kind of sympathy. Uh, if, if they are in your face, so to speak, yeah, and they're doing it to you, it is much more difficult. To, so you train with the people who are far away and gradually you bring it into your own personal situation. Uh, yeah, and then you have sympathy for them. Nothing but sympathy and compassion because you understand that they are self-destructive. Uh, 
Yes, they are hurting everyone a little bit uh, on the way, but the amount of hurt that we have to endure is tiny compared to the hurt that they are creating for themselves. So, yeah, okay, I can endure that, I can deal with that, uh, yeah. And because I have lots of good friends in the world, yeah, and I have all my karmamitas, and I have the good teaching of the Buddha, I can deal with it, but this person, they have real trouble. Uh, so you have sympathy and compassion for them instead. Uh, and then you are doing what the Buddha is saying that we should be doing it. This is the way to have compassion, really, for the entire world. So, and it is really rooted in this idea of non-self, yeah? This idea of non-self is very powerful when it is used in a practical way. Very often we make these deep teachings too theoretical, too much intellectual, and not really have enough practical significance. But here you can see a very practical application of the idea of non-self. We are conditioned as human beings, yeah? There isn't really anything there which steals us apart from conditions. And uh, the more you get that, the more we stop buying into this feeling of being in control. This is what we have. We have this feeling of being in control, and this is what kind of spoils it all. But don't believe that feeling too quickly, yeah? Question that feeling of being in control. Uh, and the more you question it, and the more you start to realize that actually there's a good, valid reason for questioning it, uh, then these kind of teachings become more alive because you start to see to the extent to which we are running on pre-existing programs, uh, like little robots running around doing uh, silly things. Okay, so that is the uh, fourth person in this uh, sutta. Now we come to the uh, very last one, the fifth person. And this is the person who has all good qualities, uh, yeah? So this is uh, interesting because sometimes we get angry even with people with all good qualities, like the Buddha, you know, people get angry with the Buddha, not recommended, but sometimes that's just what happens in the world. Uh, so this is uh, what Venerable Sariputta has to say. Uh, how should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by body and speech is pure and who gets an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time? Suppose there was a lotus pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean with smooth banks, delightful and shaded by many trees. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They would plunge into the lotus pond to bathe and drink, and after emerging, they would sit or lie down right there in the shade of the trees. In the same way, at that time, you should focus on that person's pure behavior by body and speech, and on the fact that they get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time. That's how to get rid of resentment for that person. Relying on a person who is impressive all around, the mind becomes confident. Yeah, so here we have the super duper saint, the Buddha, the Arahants, the Aryas of the world, yeah, the, the the people who really get deep meditation and all of these profound insights and what have you. And then still this person is angry. Yeah, still they are kind of, you know, seething and, and uh, I would say oppressed by the heat, weirdly th thirsty and parched. But in this case, the person is very delightful. You will notice here it is a lotus pond. Yeah, not just a pond, but a lotus pond. And there is no algae or water plants to be swept away. Yeah, no need to sweep away the lotuses because they just purify the water. And here the water is extra beautiful. It's sweet and clear and cool and clean. Yeah, there's very super delightful water. And not only is the water super duper beautiful, but even around the lotus pond, it is delightful. Yeah, it is like near that person when you come within the force field. Of such a person, yeah, then you are everything is really specially nice and beautiful as a consequence. So, uh, of course, in this case, again, you plunge into the lotus pond and drink, you imbibe all those qualities, uh, your anger dissipates, and when your anger dissipates, you start to see 
the treasure that you have found. You have found something special because you have found a treasure. You just lie down right there in the shade of those trees. You hang out in the vicinity of that person. You become maybe a disciple of that Buddha or that uh, special person. And you say, please, uh, teach me the Dhamma, because obviously here, this is a delightful place to be. Uh, and this is what happens when you find someone very special there. And uh, I don't know if you have noticed this uh, sometimes. I don't know. It is quite difficult to find these people who are really, really special. They are quite rare in the world. Yeah. For good reasons, you know, if, if everybody was really special, it, by definition, wouldn't be special anymore. So they are quite rare, but uh, sometimes you meet people that touch you in a very profound way and beautiful way. Yeah? And uh, one of these people who I've met, who I mentioned already before, is uh, this Thai monk called Ajahn Gamaha, who was the nephew of Ajahn Shah. Yeah, so uh, and, and he was very early on considered very, very powerful meditator, even in the very early years of his monastic life. Uh, and he's still around today. And I went to see him about a, a year and a half ago, just before the pandemic started. Uh, and when you are there in his presence, it's kind of uh, it's very strange to see how he deals with people. Yeah, he's a super sweet monk and he's had this kind of force field around him. This feeling of benevolence that kind of extends beyond the boundaries of his already big body. Body is already very big, but it goes way beyond that. It goes outside. And um, uh, people are attracted to it. Yeah? People just come and they sit there. Many of these people are foreigners. They don't understand a word of what he's saying. Yeah? And they still just hang around there, hang around with Ajagana just to kind of imbibe that kind of energy which he has with him. You just feel good in his presence. It's kind of very tangible when you're there. There's people come, you know, one group after the other. And he sits there sometimes for hours, just meeting one, one group and another group. Yeah, And his smile and his way of treating people is almost absolutely constant. No change almost whatsoever when it happens. Yeah. And then he does little strange things. And I always tell people about these things that happen when you are in his presence, but all these kind of things that are really weird that no one else can, can really get away with. Like, you know, he has this enormous bowls of sweets right sitting next to him, and, and he takes a handful of sweets and he throws it out on the audience, it's like raining sweets. And it's, it's very symbolic, yeah, because he's such a sweet person and the atmosphere is so sweet, and then it rains with sweets. <laughs> It's a kind of symbolism of the whole thing that is going on there. And everyone kind of scrambles to get hold of these sweets, yeah? And they take them back home. And then when they go back home, they bring the sweets with them, yeah? But of course, the point is, it's a reminder of the Dhamma. It's a reminder of Ajahn Ganda, a reminder of kindness and compassion and care and metta and all of these good qualities. That's kind of the purpose behind this, because when you unpack those sweets, it brings you back to that situation right there in Thailand. And this is the power of uh, finding this kind of person and meeting them and seeing the Dhamma alive. And of course, at that point, you really want to be a disciple. You really want to become a student. You want to understand what they're talking about because you know that obviously they have seen and found something that is very rare in the world. You cannot have that character without having developed something special. It's just bleeding obvious at this area. So uh, that is what happens and yeah and this is how it goes and then you start listening to the teachings yeah and uh, what teachings do, do, do they give people like that you know they give really profound teachings well maybe sometimes but most of the time they say things like yeah be kind be gentle man. yeah speak kindly to others and don't judge people too harshly yeah, yeah. always do acts of generosity yeah. always be of service if you have the opportunity yeah. Eva end of talk. <laughs> That's how to speak, yeah, because that is really what the Dhamma is about. That is the practice that all of us really has to fulfill. This is what we should be doing. Yeah? That is the basis. Uh, sometimes we become too, too um, caught up in, uh, you know, okay, I'm just going to meditate, or I'm just going to be really wise, I'm going to read the suttas a lot, and I'm going to, you know, think about the Dhamma in the right way, but sometimes we miss out because we don't do the basic steps of the Buddhist path, which really are all about kindness, all about caring, all about service, all about all of these kind of things, yeah? 
And so this is so, uh, so important. And this is what someone like Ajahn Ganha, this is something he understands. Uh, and that's why he teaches very often. Uh, I'm not saying we should not read the suttas. We shouldn't, because the suttas hopefully will also remind us of the, the, these things and kind of bring us in the right direction and, and uh, lead us in the right way. Uh, but we need to be careful to remember the basics of this whole path. Uh, and kindness is more basic than meditation practice. Uh, if you want, if you should choose either to meditate or to be kind, you should always choose kindness first. Uh, ideally, we do a bit of both. Uh, but uh, kindness is always the most uh, uh, fundamental things on the path upon which everything else is based and builds upon that. Uh, anyway, so you become a disciple of this person. Why is that? Well, because the person who is impressive all around, because of that person, the mind gains confidence. Uh, you see the noble ones and you feel, yay, confidence. Uh, yeah, you feel, wow, this is so beautiful. This is so marvelous. Uh, and then you, uh, you take things from there. Uh, a mendicant should use these five methods uh, to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen towards anyone. Uh, yeah, so all resentment is ideally to be uh, got rid of in this way. Yeah, there's no uh, base here for having been resentful towards anyone. Uh, the whole world, you, the Adolf Hitlers of the world or the other tyrants uh, around, uh, you know, uh, same thing again. Uh, I remember we had, um, many years ago, we had a... Um, uh, the class from the Jewish school in the Perth. Yeah, they would come to the monastery and because they, they knew about Ajahn Brahm and they wanted to hear about Buddhism. And so this Jewish school, yeah, and the teacher in that Jewish school was a very kind of progressive Jewish man. And uh, so they talked about forgiveness and these kind of things. Yeah, and Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Brahm said something about, yeah, you know, even Hitler, you have to forgive. And he said, of course, yeah, of course I have to forgive Hitler. He was Jewish, yeah, he had probably had a very good grounds for a bit of resentment. Uh, but he had kind of got that point that the only person you are hurting, if you don't forgive, well, the person you're hurting is really yourself, yeah? This is another very powerful reason to forgive and to let go and not to have resentment anywhere at all. Uh, because ultimately, you are the person who hurts most because of that. Uh, anyway, let's uh, stop there. And uh, Venerable Chandana, if uh, there are any questions, you are kind of fire away with those questions. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll see. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Ajahn. That was very, very moving talk, <laughs> as usual. But that one was particularly moving for me. So the first question, I'd like to know Ajahn's view on how we can be safe, but still try to forgive or accept people who are nasty and abusive and cannot stop causing physical and emotional harm to you or others? Hmm. Yeah, that is a very important question because uh, uh, this is exactly the situation many people find themselves in. So it's very important to tackle these things in the right way. Being compassionate and forgiving does not mean to put yourself in harm's way. Yeah? It's not this, that, that's not what it means. Uh, uh, you have to look after yourself. Remember the first person to have compassion and kindness towards is yourself. Yeah, this is the most important thing because if you're not kind and compassionate to yourself, you're not really going to be able to be kind and compassionate to others. And these things go together. So make sure that you find a way of dealing with that abuse or whatever kind it is. Uh, you know, get out of that relationship, reduce that relationship, or whatever it is. Uh, uh, but take, do something to protect yourself because it is not okay to live in an abusive relationship. Yeah, we need to look after ourselves. So, very often, the idea of forgiveness and compassion is actually an in, primarily it is an internal thing. Yeah, we forgive because we understand that actually this person they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, so it is an internal thing. Okay, I forgive you, but also I'm not going to put my Myself in harm's way. I'm not going to abuse myself by putting myself in harm's way, if you know what I mean. Then. So, this is really the right way. So, inner forgiveness, inner compassion. And if you are occasionally able to express that in a positive way, even to an abusive person, yeah, if the situation is right, you can, yeah, if you are able to do it, 
but only if you feel it is safe, but and only if you feel that it is uh, appropriate and the right thing to do. That. But uh, very often the right thing is just to uh, reduce that uh, uh, being around a person like that, so that you actually uh, get out of that uh, problematic situation. So it, it's a good, very good question, and thank you for that, because we need to be we need to do these things in a wise and skillful way. Uh, Otherwise, it becomes counterproductive. Otherwise, it becomes like a kind of self-loathing, where you load yourself, and so you kind of put yourself into harm's way. And that is, of course, that is not the idea of Buddhism at all. In fact, it is the exact opposite. Great. So I have a nice comment um, of gratitude for you. Thank you for such beautiful teachings. Awesome. I feel I've been bathing in the beautiful lotus pond for the past five days. <laughs> OK. Very good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, a question from someone else. What is the difference between contemplation and investigation? Could you also please elaborate a bit on how to investigate? Many thanks. Okay, investigation and contemplation are, I would say, I mean, these are words, so it really depends on how you use them. Yeah, but uh, I, Perhaps you could say contemplation is like taking up a particular theme and reflecting on it. Yeah, like death, for example. Yeah, you reflect, uh, you contemplate on death, and it means that you might contemplate. Well, what does it mean for me? What is it going to be like when I get there? Maybe I can do a death contemplation. Yeah, and go through the motions of dying and, and see and find out what it feels like when I die. Yeah, and to get some kind of get closer to that. Uh, uh, so that could be contemplation, whereas investigation could be more investigating what is actually happening in your life. Yeah? Contemplation is more like a theoretical thing, whereas investigation might be looking at what actually is going on in your life. So you might investigate the causes of why you get upset sometimes. Why am I getting angry? Mm. And then you kind of reflect and you realize that you're getting angry because you are looking at certain faults maybe in a person or you are you know you are not using your perception skillfully or something like that and then once you investigate in that way you start to find the solution to the problem yeah the you can change your perception do things in a different way uh, sometimes contemplation and investigation they are very similar to each other they almost merge into one thing yeah. So, for example, you know, after you come out of a meditation and then you uh, reflect back on what happened in that meditation, that could be considered investigation from one point of view and perhaps contemplation from a different point of view. But uh, it is a very good habit to have to reflect back on the meditation, ask yourself what worked and what didn't work, and then gradually kind of uncovering the causes and conditions that drive the whole meditation process. And then one day when you go, go into a very deep meditation, you have a state of samadhi or something, and you look back on the process, uh, what you start to see is you start to see the five khandhas in operation and how the khandhas are changing, how they are empty, how they are dukkha. And we will get to that later on because we're going to talk about this when we come to the Anapanasati Sutta, the mindfulness of breathing, which actually is about that. It is about the contemplation of the five khandhas. Uh, and uh, that also is part of this investigation and contemplation thing here. So contemplate, take up some of the themes in the suttas, contemplate the, uh, uh, the limitations of the sensual world, contemplate the problems of anger, how to get out of it, contemplate uh, uh, death, uh, all these things, and then investigate your own life and how it relates to that, and then ultimately come to the deep insights on the path. Uh, and that's how I would summarize contemplation and investigation. Okay, another word of thanks, Ajahn. A sincere word of thanks to Ajahn Bramali. He took us through this beautiful sutta almost three years ago in the Peak District. It still inspires and brightens my mind in new ways three years on. <laughs> Excellent, marvelous. Yeah. My mother also said to me, Ajahn, today, she said, is he going to come back to Derbyshire? <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that will happen sometime. Okay. As spiritual friendship is the whole of the spiritual life, some teachers emphasize active questioning, 
but might reflective listening and close observation be more penetrating? It's a very difficult skill to ask the right questions, isn't it? Or does it not matter whether the questions are good or not, as long as one is questioning? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, you know, this idea of close listening and reflective listening, absolutely, I, that, that's very important, you know, that's like reading the suttas also in a careful way and uh, listening carefully to the word of the Buddha as he is explained in the suttas, that is very, certainly the right thing to do. And questioning can, is also right, yeah, it, it's all about time and place, really. Uh, the Buddha talks about Dhamma Sakacha, which is, uh, you know, questioning or even Dhamma discussion. And, and it is quite common in the suttas for the monks to question the Buddha. It happens quite a lot. So questioning is great. And then, uh, you know, it is good to formulate a very precise question if you can. You know, you can get, get down, you have a very specific problem that you're having in your meditation, for example, and you formulate a very specific question about that. And, or you have a very specific a question about some doctrine in the Dhamma dependent origination, you know, what is the link between Vijnana and Namarupa, consciousness and name and form? Can we explain that more clearly? And, and, um, and, and it, it's a great question, but sometimes you don't really know exactly what your question is. Sometimes it's like, there's something I don't quite get here, but I don't know what the, que what the question is. So sometimes you can just go and you kind of start saying something, yeah, and kind of feel your way a little bit. And then, let the conversation hopefully and then maybe let the conversation take its own course but also guide the conversation a little bit like as you start to get the feeling for what is going on there that is also okay sometimes yeah because you're trying to uncover something so uh, it's all about time and place really but uh, you know it is not necessary to ask questions if you don't feel like asking questions and you and you think that you are more happy just listening and growing through reading the suttas or whatever, great, that's fine. You know, there's no, one should never be forced to ask questions simply because the Buddha says that it can, it can be good. It is not necessarily always good. Though. So do things in your own way. Don't be, you know, afraid of uh, kind of thinking independently. But uh, also don't be afraid of questioning if you do have a question. And don't be afraid of questioning a little bit, um, you know, uh, a little bit uh, in a challenging way sometimes. Uh, this is one of the things I always respect him as I'm around. He allows challenging questions. Uh, yeah, he allows you to ask almost anything. Uh, and I really respect that because it shows that he has a kind of inner security. Uh, he's not afraid of uh, you're going to kind of, uh, you know, stump him or anything like that. Or you're we're going to be, of course, if you are rude, then it's bad, yeah, and you don't want to be rude, but challenging questions is not the same thing as rudeness, so if you do it in the right way, yeah. and uh, so don't be afraid of challenging people, and if they don't know how to deal with a challenging question, well, actually, that is, uh, you know, that is kind of bad for that, on that speaker, yeah, or that person, they shouldn't really, they should be able to deal with a challenging question, they shouldn't get offended at least, but okay, if they can't answer, that's fine, but they shouldn't feel offended about that, because, uh, uh, you know, basically that says something about their, something about their own ego or something, uh, if they cannot deal with challenging questions. Uh, so I, this is something I always uh, respected as a Brahm, and, uh, it is uh, and, and one of the reasons why I have chosen him to be my teacher, really, uh, because of one among very many really exceptional qualities uh, in, uh, in Ajahn Brahm. So there's a related question. How many questions do we need to ask? <laughs> <laughs> How many questions do you need to ask? You, do, you, need, to, you need to ask uh, uh, <laughs> I, how many? Why? Who, um, just ask, ask when you have a question, yeah? And don't be afraid of asking, don't try to kind of make a question because you think you have to ask questions, but if you really have a question, then ask it, yeah? That is really the right, that is the, the right number. So ask as long as you have them, if you don't have them, don't ask, that's really end of story. <laughs> Great. Dear Ajahn, thank you so much for this talk, I found it so helpful. My question is, do you have any advice for low self-esteem? Low self-esteem, uh, yeah, you have to be more 
look at your good qualities uh, yeah embrace yourself more accept the good sides of yourself uh, uh, don't listen too much to the world around you that, that is often when we if we look for affirmation in the world around us we're going to end up with low self-esteem because we're always, always going to get quite a bit of criticism and negative comments in our life so don't worry too much about what other people say just trust your own judgment about yourself know that if you are living according to good principles yeah i don't know what how you live but maybe you live according to the five precepts or you certainly come on meditation retreats we can be absolutely sure about that um, then you are living well, yeah, you're doing something good. And you can have that inner sense of confidence, inner sense of warm feeling about yourself that you are doing the right things. So always remind yourself that you are living well. Don't be afraid of that. Don't think that you're going to get a big head just by rejoicing in your good qualities. If you rejoice in your good qualities in the right way, you get a big heart, yeah, because you are, you, you feel, you start to feel good about yourself. So uh, this is the first thing to do. The second thing is just to continue living the spiritual life, living well. And as you live well, and this is something that I have noticed in my own life, you just build up more self-esteem over time. You start to feel good about yourself, yeah? Again, not in an egotistical way at all, uh, but in a way that is just, uh, you just feel at ease with yourself, yeah? You're not, <laughs> you're not really concerned so much about the opinions of the world. And what if, a massive blessing it is not to be so concerned about the opinions of all everyone around and how irrelevant it is yeah what do other people know anyway they don't know anything yet yeah we're concerned about other people's judgment people haven't got a clue about reality the one person who would never judge us is the buddha well if the buddha doesn't judge us what what right do other people have to judge us you know what i mean uh, and uh, Ajahn Brahm, who is one of the wisest people I know, he never judges me. Even when I am outright rude, he still doesn't judge me. Yeah, He probably has compassion for me instead. <laughs> and so don't worry about other people. They don't know anything. I find it so fascinating how we are concerned about other people. And reality is that they are clueless. Yeah, By and large, they are clueless. They are walking in the dark, just like us. And uh, very often when people praise us, we kind of take it aboard. Oh, yes, yay, I get praised. Uh, but that praise is just as hollow and often as the blame. They praise without really knowing. They blame without knowing. Uh, yeah? Sometimes the praise might actually hit the mark. Uh, but that is usually the praise that comes from someone who is very discerning, uh, someone who has a lot of kindness. Then it may hit the mark. Uh, but uh, most of the time it doesn't. Uh, so don't hold on to the negative feedback, but also don't hold, hold on to the positive feedback. Because the moment you buy into the positive feedback, you will also buy into the negative stuff because they are two sides of the same thing. If someone praises you, just shrug your shoulders and think, uh, are they right or are they wrong? They're saying, I keep the five precepts, I'm a good person. Yeah, they're right, okay, so you, so you go with that, yeah? You think for yourself, then you accept the praise. And the same, same thing with the blame. Okay, lots of questions coming. Um, thank you, Ajahn, for all the amazing inspirational talks. Question, how to help a dying person who has a lot of mental suffering, but no faith nor any practice in spirituality? Okay, so uh, what uh, there is very limited what you can do because um, they're obviously coming to the end of their life and uh, but uh, what you can do is to sort of brighten up their mind a little bit. Yeah? And uh, one of the things to do is to kind of remind them of some of the good things in their life. Yeah, remind them of some of the good things they have done, maybe towards you or somewhere else. Uh, uh, some uh, character trait that they have that is very admirable and, and great. Uh, and uh, this can be very powerful because uh, especially if you have a bit of insight into their character and you know a little bit about them, this can be very profound, yeah, because we're not often reminded of our good points. So, and uh, this is one of the things I did. Yeah, I, I had my, both my, as I mentioned before, both my sister and father died within the past last couple of years. Uh, and uh, I knew they were gonna die. And I, I mean, everyone is always gonna die. So this is something we should always do. But uh, at that point, it became very, obvious and so i decided well what i should really do i should sit down and write some letters of appreciation of my father and my sister and tell them the things that i really appreciate with them yeah 
and they are good people, they were good people, so they, it wasn't very hard. Of course, when you are the son, you, you always have some challenging times with your father, that's the way things go in this world, but uh, overall, very good people. So I sat down and I wrote this out, and I wrote at length in great detail to make it really personal and very real, and it was very powerful, yeah, and I, you could feel later on when I was speaking with my father on the phone, I could feel that he had touched him in a very deep way because he wasn't used to hearing that from me he was used to hearing criticism from me yeah? this is what you do as a son you criticize your parents but sometimes you you don't know how much damage you caused all that criticism so the fact that your son turns around is a very powerful thing yeah? so these things can be very powerful so sit down yeah and and, uh, and talk to them in a very positive way remind them of something very wholesome and good in their life everyone has some good points in their life and then uh, and bring them around to you know to at least contemplate that and sometimes that is maybe maybe that is as far as it can go or you can maybe even if they're not spiritual maybe you can do some quiet meditation with them yeah just sit down hold their hand and say let's just sit peacefully together yeah and maybe because you are a peaceful person maybe you can transmit some of that peace to the person that you are sitting with yeah at the bedside there and just uh, uh, make them feel more at ease, more calm, yeah? Something like that, it, it might be worthwhile trying, yeah? Dear Ajahn, sometimes in meditation, when the relaxation deepens, the feeling of breath disappears. When that happens, the usual reaction is that fear arises and the mind rushes back to the breath. Can you please advise on how to deal with this? Okay, so uh, you don't don't have to worry. Yeah, lots of people have lost the breath in uh, uh, over many years of uh, Buddhist practice. And it's a very very common experience, and uh, you know that the body will look after itself. Yeah, you know that the body is capable of breathing without your conscious awareness because when you wake up in the morning, you are still alive. Yeah, so that's quite handy. The body can do this. You don't have to force the body to breathe there. So uh, that, is, uh, <coughs> that is the first thing that you should think, yeah? reflect, remind yourself that the body is capable of looking after itself. You don't have to worry about these things. <coughs> Excuse me. So what you do next is that you just allow that state to be. Yeah, you just carry on, you stay in that peace. And, and um, what tends to happen if you do that, if you are able to focus on the peace and develop that peace as it goes along, yeah, then it may deepen, yeah, it may become more profound. And then as it becomes more profound, it may actually encourage and bring the meditation, may actually move forward regardless of uh, the fact that you cannot see the breath. See the breath may not be required as long as you're able to stay with the peace, enjoy the peace and allow the peace to grow. That is one thing that can happen. Or if you just stay with the peace, it might be that the mind loses its momentum because it is not anchored in the breath or anchored in something else. So then you can, uh, uh, over time, it might be that the breath comes back again, yeah, because the things get a bit more coarse and they come back again. Another thing that you can do at this point, because often the problem is that the breath disappear it means that the mind isn't sharp enough and really what you might need at that point is a bit of joy yeah if you get joy coming into the mind mindfulness becomes immediately much much sharper yeah the dullness comes because there isn't enough interest in what is going on so at that point when the breath disappears you can do a very little nudging of the mind again nudge the mind towards some of these simple contemplations i think venerable chanda has been doing those in the evening yeah, so some of those contemplations about the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, something that can give rise to joy or the thought of metta or the thought of gratitude for what you have. Gratitude can be very powerful. Yeah, when you have gratitude for your Kalyana Mittas or, or whoever it might be in the world, it's a very beautiful feeling if you get that going. Yeah? Uh, just a counting the blessings in your life is kind of this old way that's also a kind of gratitude thing. Yeah? Uh, 
contemplating very briefly, reminding yourself that you've been keeping the five precepts for a long time, contemplating something nice that you have done towards somebody, act of care or generosity, whatever, something that lifts your mind a little bit and might add a little bit of a, um, joy, a little bit of that extra brightness to the mind. But you have to be very gentle. Yeah, you, I mean, you cannot think in a coarse way. It's more like just... Uh, it's more like a memory. It's like a perception that you give rise to. You don't need to verbalize very much. Yeah, it's like a you bring to mind a, a kind of a memory in a very gentle way, and it just remembers that, and then immediately the positive feelings arise as a consequence. So something like that. Yeah, but uh, the main thing is uh, to know that the body will look after itself. Yeah, and try just to stay with that for uh, a while and see what happens. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, something like that. Too. Okay. Uh, I have confidence that the path is the solution to suffering. I can also understand with my head that everything that has to do with the senses is suffering. Also, all that constant thinking is suffering. However, I see that I have lots of cravings for the pleasure of enjoying nature, pleasure of connecting with the people I love and improving things around me. It doesn't seem that I can abandon these soon. So sometimes I feel discouraged. How can I deal with this? Uh, please, please don't be discouraged because uh, remember the path is gradual. Yeah, and uh, from what you're saying, it seems like you're doing really, really well already. Of course, you want to connect with people around them. This is just not natural human need. Even when you've been a monk for many, many years, you need a little bit of connection with people around you or a nun for a long time. We still need a little bit of connection with people and to live as a complete hermit all the time. Almost nobody does that. And even those who are hermits, they can be hermit for a while, and then they kind of emerge again afterwards. So don't be discouraged. Rather than being discouraged, the way to encourage yourself is to look at where you are now compared to last year, two years ago, five years ago, whatever. See the progress that you have made. We tend to measure ourselves against, against the kind of arbitrary standard. And very often, the standard is so high. Yeah? When we read this sutta, we are looking at the world from the point of view of the normal ones, the aliens. We're looking it through a filter where the bar is already raised to the ceiling. There's a hardly any clearance at all between the two. It's very hard to get over that bar. So, you know, remember that these are aspirations, these are movements. Don't compare yourself to an impossible standard. Don't look, compare yourself where you are now to where you want to be in the future. Compare yourself where you are now compared to where you were before and see that there is progress. And uh, if you enjoy certain things that you think may be hindrances on the path, yeah, but you can't maybe be 100% sure, then just carry on what you're doing now. Yeah, Think about, reflect on these teachings. And as you reflect on them, as you carry on with your practice, Things will just happen. Then. Yeah, these things will kind of, it will kind of, uh, uh, it will unspool. Yeah, the, the, uh, the, 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 you know, so this, this will actually happen all automatically, more or less. Don't try to force, force these things. Uh, you mentioned specifically enjoying nature. Enjoying nature is perfectly fine. Uh, one of the remarkable things that you find in the sutta is you find that the Arahant monastics, yeah. Uh, because uh, that's what you find in the sutta sometimes, they often did enjoy nature. Uh, they would, you know, sing nature's praises uh, and they would say, ah, oh, what a wonderful thing it is to live in nature. Um, and so living in nature is, a, is actually a conducive to the spiritual path. But one of the things about the sensory world is to remember that there are sensory inputs that drive you in the right way and sensory inputs that head you off in the wrong way. Uh, and nature is a set kind of sensory input that tends to lead you in the right direction because nature is subtle. It is not a coarse form of craving when you crave to be in nature. It's a very subtle form of craving and desire. Yeah, It is not like uh, eating or anything like that where, where the hunger and craving can be very powerful. Uh, and it is a, it is a uh, when you are in nature, it tends to be peaceful. Uh, you are away from the core sensual pleasures of the world. Uh, tends to lead you in the right direction. I often you just want to sit down and look at a beautiful and peaceful view maybe around you. Yeah. So nature is positive. So don't worry too much about that. Uh, one thing to be with people. 
again, the most important thing there is just to make sure that you, you know, are generally with reasonably wholesome people. Remember the importance of the Kalyanamitta, yeah, and try to guide your life just gradually, carefully in the right direction. So to me, from what you're saying, it sounds like you're doing really well, yeah, so rejoice in the fact that you are on the path, you're heading in the right direction. And as you do that, you're going to find the solution to all of these conundrums that you may, may look funny now, but all of the solutions will, will arise over time. And then you will, all of these things will uh, head, you know, you, you look back and then you will see, yeah, now I can understand what, what all of these things actually mean. Uh, this, you will find solution to these things. It's just that when we are not at the end of the path, it is almost impossible to understand the nature of the path as seen from the point of view of the areas, the noble people of the world. Great. Thank you, Ajahn, for another beautiful, profound and practical teaching. If someone's not being kind to me, I find it difficult to generate genuine metta back to that person straight away. What steps can I take to develop metta and forgiveness from the heart, rather than just saying, may that person be well, and not feeling and radiating true metta? Would it be best mm. to avoid the person? Does this quality take time to develop because I still have the self in me? Thank you. Um, yes, it is, it is very hard to, to do that because it is almost impossible because um, metta actually means seeing the good qualities of the person. So uh, what you have to do then is first of all you have to forgive that person. Yeah, you have to and then forgiveness leads to letting go. And then once you have let go, then it is possible to have metta towards that. Path. And that forgiveness can happen through the kind of contemplations I was talking about just before. Yeah, yeah the contemplations of the person really not knowing what they're doing and <clears throat> being out of control, being trapped in their own personality, and all of these kind of things. And, and then you can forgive, but even forgiveness often takes time. It is, um, you know, the reality is that we all have our sense of self, maybe not everyone, but a lot of, you know, the vast majority of people have a sense of self, and, and we will read the world in terms of that self. It is the ideal is that we don't do that, that we will tend to. But don't be surprised that you react in such a way with people. Um, so uh, then if you if you want to do meta meditation, instead of focusing on that person, one of the things you can do is you can do meta to the directions instead. You have the four directions and not really focusing on individuals at all. And then just remind yourself that there are good beings in this world. And sometimes you can uh, you know, build up the perception inside of all the good qualities in the people in a certain direction. Or you can focus on the devas yeah, in that direction. And of course, the devas will have lots of beautiful qualities. Yeah? And then you can, instead of saying, may you be well and happy, you can just say, thank you for being part of this world. Yeah, thank you for being my kalanamitas. And thank you for making the world a better place. And it's a kind of gratitude that arises. But it's, you know, these feelings are very close to each other. So it doesn't really matter so much exactly, uh, you know, as long as they are very wholesome feeling arising inside of you, yeah, it will be heading in the right direction. So try something like that, yeah, and see if that can overcome the thing. And you don't really ever have, have to direct meta towards individuals at all. You can actually always space them on directions. And it has the advantage that with individuals, uh, it is very easy to see the negative side and the positive side, and with the positive side, and very difficult to pull these things completely apart, and it can lead to the meta kind of petering out, not really working. Yeah. Uh, whereas when you go to the directions, because you are creating an image in your mind, uh, it is much easier, may maybe at least for some people, to sustain the meta as a consequence. So experiment a little bit like that and see what happens. It, it is fascinating in the suttas, the Buddha always talking about, talks about doing metta to the four directions. He doesn't really talk very much about individuals at all. That is a development you find in the Visuddhi Manga, the comment, the large commentary on the suttas. It doesn't mean the Visuddhi Manga is wrong, uh, but still it is interesting to see how the Buddha does this in the suttas. Right. We've got about three more questions, so um, yeah. I'll go for this one. 
This retreat is very inspiring and my confidence in the path has grown a lot. However, Jane's fundamental ethical principle of nonviolence to all forms of life has strongly resonated in my heart and mind. Could you please comment on the Buddhist perspective of Jainism, I guess, please? Okay, oh, I'm dead. I, I, what I can do is, is, is talk about the Buddhist perspective of non-harming of all life, because that is kind of the main idea here of Jainism. And um, it is, uh, you know, it is actually one of the three uh, sankhapas, the three intentions, yeah, uh, on the Noble Eightfold Path. After right view, the three intentions are the intentions of, uh, of renouncing, renouncing the sensual world on non-ill will, abhyapana, which is basically like metta. And the third one is abhihingsa or ahingsa, which is really like non-harming, yeah, or you could say compassion. So it is also a very important part of the Buddhist path. It's actually fundamental to the Buddhist path. But the way it is practiced in Buddhism is slightly different from the Jains. So the Buddhist idea is more that more like we should not, we should not be inconsiderate. We should not be ruthless. We should not be cold-hearted for how our actions affect other beings. So for example, if you are walking down the path, and you see there's lots of ants on this path, uh, then you don't just walk there. You think, yeah, what, what, who cares about these ants? Yeah, they are walking. This is a human path, not an ant path. They have no right to walk on the human path. Yeah, ants go away. Something like that. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't have any anger with the ants. You don't have upset with them. You just couldn't care less whether you trample them down. That is an example of being inconsiderate and ruthless and cold-hearted towards your effects on the world around you, yeah? Or it could be things like having a garden. I mean, and this, I know is very, this is very important in a country like England, yeah? Uh, because gardens is a very, very big thing in the UK. And my own family lived in the UK for 27 years. My parents lived there for a long, long time. And, and they had a very beautiful garden. And my mother became a super duper gardener while she lived over there. And she loved her gardens. And so did all the neighbors and everyone. And of course, then it, it becomes hard to, you know, you don't get insects and things that want to eat those garden plants. It becomes very difficult. You become a bit ruthless. Yeah, you become a bit inconsiderate for those animals. And you will put out poison to kill the snails or whatever it is and all this kind of stuff because they, you know, that is more important to you than the actual garden. You may not have any, maybe you actually do have a bit of ill will in that case against those snails. Maybe you do, but even if you don't, you're being inconsiderate. Or you are like a business person. Yeah, and you have a business and you, you, what is important to you is to develop your business and to make money and to gain status so your business is successful and you don't care so much about the effect it has on maybe your employees or on competitors or on, on anyone really, as long as you can build that business up. Very common, I think, in the business world to be quite ruthless. And sometimes ruthlessness is like praised in the business world. You've got to be tough. Actually, you're just building up bad karma if you do that. So what is happening here is really that you are, um, because we have desires, yeah, this, this, the desires override our care for other beings. So, yeah, it's a desire that is coming from a cold place, a desire uh, based on carelessness for the world around us. That is really what this Abhihingsa is about. It's a cold heartedness. <clears throat> and that is bad karma, that is actually leads to bad results because of that coldness. So that is the way of thinking about non-harming in Buddhism. With Jainism, though, it is different, yeah, because in Jainism, they take it even one step further, you know? they take it so far that uh, not only should you be incons not inconsiderate, uh, but you should do your very best in all circumstances not to harm any living beings. In other words, you go with a broom and you sweep the ground, so even if you can't see those beings, even if they are invisible to you, yeah, at least you have swept the ground, you've done the very, very best to be able to move around it. So sometimes they take it to an extreme and it is kind of, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, but it becomes, it becomes a point when it becomes impractical or you can't really live. So uh, it, comes, it comes a point when this idea of being considerate to all beings becomes an, or more like an obstacle than something useful. 
So you need to find that balance where you are considerate, yeah, in the in the general way of how you live, but you don't take it to the point whereby it becomes impossible to live your life because uh, it's just too many, uh, you know, variables to take into account. The equation becomes too complex, and then you cannot get anything done whatsoever. Um, in Ajahn's opinion, can we help our pets to get a better rebirth? Sure, of course you can. Yeah, <laughs> what you have to do is you have just the best way to get a good rebirth. Remember the causes that give rise to a good rebirth. Yeah, it is basically a happy mental state. If you die in a good mental state, feeling good about yourself, and you are generally happy, that is when the good rebirth happens. So be kind to your pets. Your pets know that you're being kind to them. Be kind to them, be caring, look after them. Do all the right things. That is how you're maximizing the chance for good rebirth for a pet. Yeah, because you are reminding them of kindness. They will feel that inside, and then something will happen to that pet which will guide them in the right direction. Um, sometimes you get the question of people who have uh, dementia, yeah, Alzheimer's or whatever it is, and the question is, well, what can we do for people with dementia? And uh, the point there is to Remember that behind that demented brain, there is a consciousness and mind is still there. And sometimes if you do things in the right way, you can reach behind the demented physical brain to the deeper recesses of the mind. Yeah? And because you, something there is still working, be kind even to demented people. Be, speak kind words to them, care for them. Yeah? And it is quite possible I would say quite likely that they will actually benefit from that. Uh, and then just before they die, they may come out of a demented state for a short time. And maybe they will say to you, oh, thank you so much for caring for me for all of these years when they die. <laughs> you know, uh, some of that happens. Uh, and uh, so uh, never underestimate the power of kindness uh, in all areas of life. Uh, and uh, whether animals, demented uh, people, ghosts, yeah, be kind to the ghosts. That's what we do when we offer things to the departed and be kind to the devas, be kind to everyone, all living beings. Okay. okay, last question. It seems to me that attention is a condition for consciousness. Is attention part of Nama? If not, where does it fit in with dependent origination? Uh, yes, it is part of Nama. It is part of, uh, uh, it is specifically said to be part of Nama. Um, Attention is really a sub factors of volition, yeah, of the will, because when we attend, it means that we are directing our mind in a certain way to a certain thing. That's what attention means. Yeah? You're attending to something, you're directing the mind. That direction of the mind comes from the will. Yeah, we are willing a certain thing, we have a certain volition. And in that sense, um, attention is directly there in the five kandas. The second kanda, uh, the, th uh, the fourth kanda is sankara, and sankara is precisely the will. So attention comes under the sankara kanda, the fourth kanda. Uh, it is, it, it, I don't think, I think it, is, it is a cause for consciousness, but it is a condition for a particular kind of consciousness. Yeah? The kind of consciousness that you have will depend on attention. So if you attend to a sight, then you have eye consciousness. If you attend to the hearing, you will have ear consciousness. Uh, and it, of course, depends on what sight and what hearing you are attending to. So <clears throat> the kind of consciousness that you have will depend on your attention. But the fact of consciousness, that you are conscious at all, that depends on rebirth. Once you have been reborn, guaranteed that you will be conscious. But exactly where you are conscious, will depend on attention. So the two different kinds of conditions that, uh, uh, that uh, both have to come together in a certain way. Thank you. That's, that's it, Ajahn, for today. Okay, very good. So, so thank I, you very yeah. much. Shall we do the three sadhus? <laughs> sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs> Excellent, everyone. Very nice to see you all again, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn. Bye -bye.